I'm going to begin with the mantra of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, my teacher, as inspired by Paulina Dakini. And I'm going to start with Om Ah Vajay Guru, Manjushri Vakindra, Bhattaraka, Sumatinyana, Shasanadara, Samudra, Shri Bhadra, Sarva Siddhi, Ho Ho. That's how I'm going to begin. It's the name mantra of His Holiness Dalai Lama. And it's a good way to start with uh, saluting my guru. And uh, of course, one thing about Tibetan Buddhism that my root teacher, my spiritual friend, Keshe Bonja, was always insisting about, we must be clear that they are not really deifying lamas because the lamas themselves are very determined that they not be considered or not think that people are trying to present themselves as the fourth jewel. All Buddhism always has three jewels in which you take refuge, jewels being rare and precious things in the cycle of, of un, unhappy and un, unenlightened life. And um, that is the Buddha as the teacher of the possibility of freedom from suffering and enlightenment, perfect enlightenment and perfect loving wisdom. And then the Dharma, which is the reality itself of that, which makes it attainable, because that is what reality is, and that's the teaching of that reality. And then Sangha is the community of those who are, have already attained that, or who are seeking to attain it, and helping others do so. And those are the three jewels, and they are in a way mind, speech, and body. Uh, they relate to mind, speech, and body. And what the, what the Lama can be for the practitioner who is very, very determined and very, very impatient to reach enlightenment in order to be able to help other beings, it can be that the, the Lama offers their body to be a uh, reminder, an icon, like a statue in a temple for the Sangha. They offer their speech to be a reminder and an access doorway to the Dharma, which is the teaching and the reality taught of the freedom and of uh, love and happiness. And the, and the mind of the Lama is offered as a doorway to the uh, uh, Buddha, who is the teacher of that, who is one who has attained it himself and who is the teacher of that. So therefore, the Lama becomes a, a personal representative of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. So they are still only the three jewels. But the beauty and the genius of Tibetan Buddhist version, uh, which became also Mongolian and now is becoming global, is that this possibility of being in refuge in the three jewels is possible for all beings, all human beings at least, who can read in some language and who can talk <laughs> and who can restrain their instinctual impulses uh, best, uh, which human being can do, and who have the have the incentive, the vulnerability of wanting to do that because they're close to a less advantageous life forms, other, rather than the gods who are also very intelligent, but they get very complacent because they 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 live in too much of a like a gated community <laughs> of people who think they're immune from suffering. They get to think that, and they don't realize the tempor temporality of that state. So they don't feel the vulnerability like the human does. So anyway, so that's the thing. So uh, I just wanted to mention that as we start. So that's why I'm starting with Dalai Lama, saluting him is like taking refuge in the three jewels. And also the three jewels can be taken refuge through any other religion. It's what His Holiness Dalai Lama has been manifesting, even though he likes Buddhism himself, for himself. But he is against exclusivism in religions. And therefore, he thinks that we have to see that you can get there through Jesus, through Moses, through Rabbi Hillel, through uh, 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 Kidzer, Al Kidzer, you know, or Al Atar, you know, or Ibn Arabi, or Muhammad, or through Krishna, or through Yajna Valkya, or through Patanjali, or through Shankaracharya, or through Lao Tzu, or through Confucius, or through any number of indigenous shamans who, who don't do, who, who are against violence, who are into non-violence, in an indigenous place. And that's something unique for Shambhala, 
in the future, in Buddhist future sort of uh, <clears throat> millennialism, and it's possible in the present for anybody in any religion, even in secularism, who thinks that we can have a very happy world now. We don't have to wait till somebody's made more money. We don't have to wait till somebody's conquered somebody else. We don't have to wait for any of these things. And any leaders who think who, who lead that way should be rejected and sent back to school. Not, not killed or imprisoned, but sent back to school. <clears throat> And all prisons should be schools, not punishment places, but schools. And so just a little bit enforced school. <laughs> you don't get to graduate until you have conquered your anger and greed and je jealousy and pride, uh, you know, the unreasonable forms of those energies and delusion. Okay, then you graduate. But so I want to go back a little bit about samadhi because samadhi is so important. Because one of the ways that people content themselves with living in a, you know, an imperfect and, uh, world where dharma is not accessible to everyone, education and liberating education is not accessible to everyone, um, and uh, uh, is they think that the whole world and all relative existence is always going to be imperfect. They misunderstand the first friendly fun fact or the first noble truth of the suffering of the ignorance-dominated lifestyle into thinking that life itself is simply always ignorance-dominated and so is horrible. And so they want to develop samadhi to go into some state apart from life situation. And even, and I begin that as said, Buddha allowed his... his uh, individual vehicle students, that is like Theravada, and not only Theravada, Mahasangika and uh, Vatsuputriya and other kinds of uh, dualistic Buddhist uh, monastic paths or, or mendicant paths that were taught by Buddha, 18 different schools that were originally not only Theravada. I think out of the 18, maybe eight were Theravada, and nine or so were Mahasangika, what are called, and then there was a couple of deviant ones. And uh, which are dualistic in the sense that they think that nirvana is a way outside the world. So the reality of nirvana and the reality of the world are two different realities. In that sense, dualistic. And then samadhi becomes their goal to get outside the world. And then that will, that's very similar to dualistic forms of Hinduism, where they think that the idea is to develop a mind that is so powerful that it withdraws from all engagement with other things. And, go, and there is a space that is pure freedom, separate from it, which is the absolute space where you can be eternally liberated. And they think that. And um, um, Vedanta, there are versions of Vedanta like that, which, which they kind of call dualistic non-dualism. Because <laughs> in a way, they irrationally say that that state, once you reach it, you realize that the other state simply doesn't exist. So all the other people are destroyed, in a way, in your mind, and you, your old being was destroyed. And you're just in some separate space where there are no beings. So Buddha said, uh, even to those dualistic ones, that that's the description of the four formless states that I just described in the last session, very in detail. Um, and in their sutras describing them in more detail, and there are also Hindu sutras that describe them in great detail. They have also great samadhis to reach them. But Buddha rejects them in the sense of being eternal. They also are states that you weren't in before, and when you achieve them, you feel you're not no longer existent with any suffering, except boredom, perhaps. But anyway, you don't have any conscious. You're like, they're like unconscious in a super subtle way where you're glad to be unconscious at the subtlest level of being consciously unconscious. <laughs> and, but they still are a state that is different from the previous state. And also they did not destroy all the other beings and the rest of the relative world. And, and the sense of you being in an infinity is an artificial infinity, which is your projection into the, into the concept of infinity as if it were a place or a thing. Whereas infinity is everything, of course. 
We're all in infinity now, or it wouldn't be infinity. Because we can't exclude it from where we are and what we are. We're permeated by infinity, so to speak, because it's just a negation. It's, it's, like, it's like, in a way, we can be permeated by nothing, and it wouldn't change our somethingness, because nothing is nothing. <laughs> so it's, it's a kind of reification of a kind of negation, like nothing is. Infinity. So, so therefore, you can't quantize infinity, so to speak. You can't live in it more than you already do, because you're already there. Okay, so that's really important <clears throat> to then come to the deeper idea that right now and here we are in nirvana. So we now we're free. And this freedom is not boring because we're involved with lots of other beings. And then among them, there are some who are not happy. And that makes an exciting task of helping them find the happiness of now. That's the key thing. Like the wonderful Power of Now guy, uh, Eckhart Tolle, who has beautifully done that. Although in doing that, in order to help nihilistic Westerners, brought up in scientific materialist educational curriculum, he did not challenge the difference between being in an infinite nothing and being in an infinite freedom that is invested in love. So unfortunately, he hasn't carried them all the way. This is not all of them. Some, I'm sure, because I think he understands that. I don't know, really. Nobody, I'm not a Buddha, so I can't really tell. But I think he does. Buddha allowed his individual vehicle students to imagine that nirvana was just such a state beyond the gross physical reality of the desire realm and beyond even the more subtle pure form realm divine abodes, you know, infinite space, infinite consciousness, absolute nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, beyond even the formless media, and maybe something like a state of, I say medium, because it's not a space, really, even though it's called infinite space. Once it's infinite, it's not really space, because there's no opposite, so it doesn't mean anything. So it's called a medium. And maybe something like a state of seeming total obliteration of presence, a kind of ninth state beyond the fourth formless medium. He put them into the paradoxical situation of not equating nirvana with any kind of formless state, yet allowed them to think of it as something other than the relative world that they perceived as pure suffering. He taught that by overemphasizing the first noble truth or friendly fun fact, although seeing it that way, so the friendly fun fact simply describes how they see it, it because of their great sensitivity of such wonderful persons as dualistic Buddhas. He taught the samsara nirvana duality as the provisional situation for those disciples Though, as we saw in the great focus on mindfulness discourse, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, he's constantly hinting at the non-duality that is the real solution. In my opinion, that was because their fixated ego sense was so strong and so rigidly imagined as their real self, apart from relational things, that they could only envision release as a glorified projection of their desperate desire to withdraw permanently and escape into this imagined absolute disconnected self. In other words, he had to let them imagine a state of ultimate psychosis as ultimate freedom. Once they had done their best at that, he knew they would feel more secure, finally, and then bored with that, and then, intended, then he intended to appeal to their subtle and refined intelligence to recognize that the seemingly separate absolute could not be absolute since they had related to it by entering it experientially. This then brought them back into contact with the more challenging quest of maintaining the natural bliss of release while remaining infinitely interconnected with everything which is defined as the fully awakened condition of nirvana as samsara, samsara as nirvana. So in a sense, no nirvana and no samsara, just the brilliant, blissful, loving, wise life force immersion. 
clear light, magic body immersion, living in the miracle, miraculous world of, of love. So then another, a new heading, the non-dogmatism of Buddha's inner science. One Buddhist hermeneutical principle, more or less agreed upon by all the great Indic philosophers, I say, or Buddhic, you could even say, they don't have to be Buddhist, is that the only teaching of the Buddha that is definitive in meaning is emptiness, voidness, selflessness, nirvana, or freedom. All of them absolute negations. Absolute in the sense of non-implying negations. In other words, negations that are not contextual or non-obviously contextual. For example, if you say, well, if you're, if you're negating something within a binary situation, like, is there an elephant in the room or is there no elephant in the room? When you then realize there's no elephant, there's no elephant, then you re it has to be no elephant. So within that situation, negating the elephant implies that there is not an elephant. But it doesn't imply that there are, there's a floor, there's a window, there are rooms. Not directly. Actually, it does. <laughs> so the concept of absolute negation is only relatively absolute. And these are, these, but these are binary rational things, this idea of an absolute negation versus an implicative negation, a negation that implies something else. <clears throat> so, for example, somebody, you know, should not, when they say, don't drink alcohol, you're not implying that you should drink water in any obvious way. You're just negating the drinking of alcohol. Uh, whereas if you, well, there's four things to drink here, so don't drink that one. Then the implying, when, if you set up that context, you're implying that you drink one of the other ones. That's called implicative negation. So all of those negations are exclusion negations, you can also call it, maybe a little better than absolute. Not to get tangled up in the absolute thing. So exclusion negations. So, uh, 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 yeah, absolute negation or exclusion negations. All descriptions of relative realities are conventional and relative, true or false enough, valid or invalid enough in specific contexts, but none of them is absolute or definitive. So none of them is dogmatically or absolutely true. Hence, a scientific argument can be made that our present materialist astrophysical standard model of the universe or cosmos is true for us in our context, accounting for our present sensory and theoretical experiences, Hubble telescope visions, astronautical explorations, etc., and the mathematical theories derived therefrom. But that standard model is not and may never be absolutely true forever. And there may be, may be new models developed by the Einsteins and Buddhas of the future. Sci-fi writers may be probing imaginatively toward such new models, with materialist scientists trailing along behind, mathematically moving from experiment to experiment. I often think it is helpful to our absolutism, as directed toward the solar system, to recognize that everything in the static model we encounter in planetariums is actually an extremely rapid motion relative to any frame of reference outside it. When we stand at the equator, we are in motion with the rotating Earth's surface at 1,000 miles per hour. The planet is in motion around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The sun is moving through the galaxy at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, and the galaxy moves within the nebula at an inconceivable speed, basically almost at an infinite speed, but not, of course, at an infinite speed, because there is no such thing. So we and the solar system bodies are not static objects, but actually ribbons of matter and energy somehow swooshing through the space-time cosmos at dizzy rates, all inter-entangled with other swooshing ribbons. Combine that macro inconceivability in your imagination with attempts to picture our micro-constitution by wave-particle indeterminate quantum entities, and you can experience a collapse of the picturing function moment. 
Turning to the three realms, desire, for pure form, and formlessness realms of the Buddhist inner scientific, inner scientific cosmos, and we can return to the contemplative super-education culminating in samadhi, which involves combining serenity of one-pointed concentration with critical insight contemplation. When that serenity point focuses on the coarse and fine dimensions of our being in the world, we can go in or up with critical insight penetration through the four immensity contemplations and the four formless trance concentrations, and then return to enjoy being present to sensory ordinary existence, carrying the flow of bliss and serenity that suffuses our being. Once we experience any level of the formless mediums, we leave awareness of the body and the heartbeat, and so depart from any sense of time. When we return into lucid, wakeful, coarse body sensory awareness, we then confront the issue of being in time, having experimentally and experientially verified that time itself is not an absolute. Time is also a purely relative dimension, just like mass and space. I love this one because, and I'm trying to understand it, and when I do, I will, I think, have gotten there. Because time is kind of invisible, you know. So past and future, we think. So we're so hung up on our vision. So past and future uh, are invisible to us. And we can see, have a mental picture of something that happened in the past. Like uh, when I came in this room, like 30 minutes ago, there was a beautiful Dakini singing who I didn't recognize because she had changed her hair too. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. And then I, oh, oh Paulina, then I got it. But at first I didn't. So I can have a picture of that event in my mind, but it's invisible to me now as far as vision goes, with the eye sense and the whole brain mechanism that's connected to the eye and the huge realm and field and cloud of concepts that connect to seeing things because we're so into our vision. And time makes the future also invisible to us, but in, what's in some sense, um, it isn't actually, probably, if we really get a strong sense of the, we begin to imagine the future as where we encounter infinity. But then if we do, when we encounter infinity, we are already in infinity. So becoming a Buddha might be a big anticlimax, actually. So, somehow, some people think, though, maybe they whisper that idea. And in that sense, I had a really wonderful idea. You know, in the, in the Theravada, that is the dualistic Buddhists, if we call Theravada dualistic and Mahayana non-dualistic, which is the way of the big, vast Buddhist groups at the moment on the planet, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, <coughs> if not billions of people. Uh, if we divide it that way, then in their sutta that they consider accurately describing the Buddha's leaving the body, what they describe is he goes up through the eight his samadhi is so powerful, Buddha. He goes up through the eight uh, realms. But in a way, it's only a show because, of course, the Buddha is always in the eight realms, completely. In other words, he's always there and not there simultaneously. That's how he knows everything. He's illusory. But anyway, he appears to go because there's one audience of somebody who's not yet an um, arhat, who's not yet enlightened, which is Ananda, his personal because he's the one expressing it and reciting the sutra. So we hear it through his, his perception. And in his perception, he perceives Buddha ranging as a sort of still, as a still other being, a separate being from himself, Ananda, Ananda, as going up through the four love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, measurable states, immense states, then through the infinite space, infinite consciousness, absolute nothingness, and beyond nothingness and somethingness, or beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. 
And then, and then when he gets there, he thinks the Buddha is gone because he reaches the point where you can actually get to a place where you feel gone. Okay, and he's feeling Buddha, feeling, emphasizing that feeling, although Buddha has to always be everywhere or he wouldn't be Buddha by definition. And then he says to Mahakashapa, the Arhat, next to him, Buddha's prime successor, as it were, he says, now he's gone. Oh, my friend, the Buddha, Siddhartha, now Shakyamuni, he's gone. Because Ananda was his relative when he was, before he was Buddha. And, and, and Mahakashapa says, nope, not yet, didn't leave the body yet. Really? But anyway, okay. So then it says Buddha comes back down into nothingness, down the, the experience of nothingness, down into uh, infinite space, down into infinite consciousness, down into in, in, infinite or Im immense equanimity, joy, compassion, and love. Dropping the equanimity down into infinite joy, compassion, and love. Dropping that down into immeasurable compassion and love. And then down into immeasurable love, the base of the, the boundary between there and the, and the final desire realm, which is a realm of pure bliss, pure fantastic orgasmic bliss, without any body, actually disembodied. <laughs> At that boundary. And then, boundary of being a bounded being versus a kind of energy being. And then, then Ananda experiences Buddha as going up again to immense love, immense compassion and love, immense joy and compassion and love, and immense equanimity, joy, joy and compassion and love. And then at that place, he feels the Buddha leave the body. And he said, and he agrees with God. And then Kashyapa says, now he's gone. And so he, that means now he left the Shakyamuni coarse body all that he'd been in on earth. And now they're going to have a huge bunch of ceremonies of cremation and division of relics and all kinds of magical things because he, he makes sure that that coarse body becomes a source of all kinds of miraculous art objects. <laughs> and then then the, 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 the great monks, uh, Mahakashapa, the great mendicants, have to mediate and pre prevent a war between a bunch of city-states, eight of them, who all want all the relics, the, the fantastic art objects that a Buddha plans for before they die, and they fabricate their, their ashes and relics into that. And uh, they just allow the body to burn to teach impermanence, because actually Buddha is still everywhere. So they didn't actually leave any, anything. But that's how it's taught. But what, what, what that teaching is so cute, though, because in Mahayana, in the Pure Land School, the uh, Pure Lands, like Sukhavati of Buddha Amitabha, like Abhirati of Buddha Akshobhya, of uh, the Pure Land of the Jewel Buddha, or the Sambhava Pure Land of Amit of, of uh, of all the other ones, you know, which are like super celestial abodes, which are heavens where you never can escape from the Buddha, so you have really rapid teaching, and where big sinners even can go and be enclosed in lotuses and then kind of get out of their egotism uh, very much more rapidly than they do by being punished anywhere. So those pure lands, and those pure lands also have no hells and no animal kingdoms and no whatever. And they're amazing, actually. And there's whole. It was a vast field in in in, the, in Buddhist history of heavens and pure lands, and corresponding, of course, to any positive, wonderful, beautiful, mystical vision of heaven, like Dante's vision of being unified, united with Beatrice, you know, and uh, which man, he managed to push through the very prudish Western visions of heaven, you know. So anyway, it's really marvelous. I just thought of that. So, so there's the thing. Okay, so then super subtle is a heading. Super subtle esoteric inner science or tantric abhidharma is I still going in this samadhi. Because the samadhi one is really very great. It's where you have really powerful, uh, powerful sense, you know. Although you can become, some people I know can become obsessed with, with they, because they will always think they're not one-pointed enough 
But actually, every human being, every human being has samadhi. Samadhi is one of the five ubiquitous mental factors in Abhidharma, because every human being can concentrate on something. Like a tribal person who's a great hunter can lie and wait and practically suspend their breathing, because not to not to let a a wandering gazelle who they plan to shoot with their bow and arrow feel their breathing or even hear that sort of subliminally sense their heartbeat. They practically suspend their heartbeat and make it very minimal and get and go into a kind of hibernating hunter's silence that you almost can't, it's invisible to even the, the super smell sense, the super uh, you know, vibration sense of, of, the, of uh, prey animals. And that's one-pointedness. So they, that means that's the ubiquitousness of samadhi, just like there's a ubiquitousness of intelligence in humans. And you know they have the five ubiquitous mental factors. And it's just when you become a yogi, you can heighten that to, to an extraordinary degree, where you can completely leave your ordinary sense faculties and leave your sensation of being in a body completely behind. The mind and the subtle energy forms that the mind can use to embody itself are so incredibly powerful. And therefore, when we, you know, there's a thing in the Theravada called the five indriyas, which people often translate the five powers sometimes or the five faculties. But what they are, why they are five, is because they are analogous to the five senses. And they are faith, you know, a will, um, one pointedness and intelligence, and some other one I can't remember exactly, but the names, but there are five things. And, but what, those become the body of a yogi. So when yogi goes into a kind of trance state, they don't feel like they have arms or butt or you know, cross legs or all of those things. And actually, the cross-legged posture, the posture of Arochana, with the hands folded like that, the thumb tips touching, etc., the, the shoulders in this way and that way, and the breath coming through the nostril, the tongue on the palate, all of those things, and the eyes focused at the tip of the nose, the most boring possible place, all of them have to do with getting away from the five senses. And then having a body made of faith and wisdom and, and one point in samadhi and everything, and then using that samadhi with mental objects, and the ultimate mental object is the four friendly fun facts. And then within the four friendly fun facts, then the third one is the nirvanic fact. And nirvana will take you past even and not being stuck in some trance state, which the ultimate one of being simultaneously conscious and unconscious is boring. And nirvana shouldn't be boring. That's really cool. So therefore, stop being, you know, so they become, people become obsessed. In a little bit, it's a danger in the, there's a little bit of a danger in the dualistic form of Buddhism if they haven't really focused on the other branches of the scripture than just the samadhi, mindfulness ones, because the ones about the jatakas, about the bodhisattva being a deer and a monkey and a this and a that, and loving other people, being a good king among humans who would even give their eyeballs to show the power of compassion to a blind person, to show that the king is the most compassionate person in a society, no society where the king is not a genuinely compassionate, selfless person, can function well because it creates a bad example for the other beings that they won't try to be more kind and more self-restrained, and et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, the society will just be part of everybody policing everybody else and become a nightmare. And so that whole literature teaches non-dualism. It teaches goodness is in life. It teaches nirvana in the, fourth noble, the first noble truth and the third noble truth, non-dual. And the third one, more powerful than the suffering one, the bliss one more powerful, the liberation, freedom more powerful than bondage, but both interconnected. And where connection is no longer bondage because you feel free, in, which is what you do when you're in love. You're free in connecting. You're voluntarily connecting. That's why you feel free. But it's, you still connect. You see? So that's so good. So, so that's why they say some people, uh, you know, uh, that's why the, the wonderful Chodin Rinpoche, who I never physically met in this life, 
to my detriment, to my loss. He said in a footnote, or he had said verbally, but he didn't say it in his text, but in, then his disciples put it in a footnote to an edited after he died story about how some disciples in the great monasteries who the senior uh, lama, senior gurus, the, the achieved ones, not necessarily seniors, maybe younger sometimes, but achieved, who recognized had special aptitude for unexcelled yoga tantra, high tantra, were discouraged from trying to get too much into the quietistic samadhis of the formless states and the, even the immensities. They would recite the immensities and they knew about the formless states, but they wouldn't be too into them uh, too soon because rather they, they would develop that one point in us much more powerfully when using the imagination because to get into the samadhis you have to you completely suppress the imaginative faculty and it is the imaginative faculty the artistic faculty that enables like which in the tantra you create mandala you create the divine bodies and so forth it's desire realm divine bodies by the way and you do that and that way you can accelerate your non-dualistic achievement much more and you you don't go into the danger of craving the disembodied states too much, which can become, a, can become a danger for the highly sensitive person. I was so amazed to hear that. I really was. Anyway, uh, 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 so this brings us to so super subtle esoteric inner science, tantric Abhidharma. That's right. That's what I want to say. This brings us to the issue of lifespan and death. And here we turn from the Abhidharma or super science of the causal individual and universal vehicles and into the Abhidharma super science of the fruitional, secret, and subtle universal vehicle known as tantric or vajra diamond vehicle. This is where the inner exploration of mind realms gets in detail into the exploration of the death and rebirth and between state. Sanskrit antarabhava, or Tibetan bardo processor, between state. I, I did a new translation of Book of the Dead myself after there already were several at the request of a publisher, partially because my original guru told me to in a subtle, in a subtle hinted way, but part of, partly also because I can't stand people talking about intermediate state just drives me crazy when bardo simply means between and antara simply means a gap something in between so it's a gap state a between state and I've always wanted to be able to be sung to the music of when they begin the between and you can't say when they begin the intermediate it's just so terrible I can't take it so, okay, Antarabhava, I'm sorry. I know that's a digression, I apologize. These are well codified esoterically in the unexcelled yoga tantras, especially in detail in the esoteric community tantra literature. They are also popularly known in Tibet and Mongolia, and nowadays all over the world, through the work known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, a misnomer given by its first translator into English. The actual Tibetan title is The Great Book of Liberation Upon Hearing in the Between. It was an ironic mistake, since the central insight of that type of inner science work is that there are no such things as dead people, since people and other beings don't stay dead, but just imagine, just migrate, sorry, not imagine, just migrate from lifetime to lifetime always continuing on through various between states. It's like people don't live in doorways. They walk through doorways from one room to another. But if you, if you try to find a doorway, you will, never, you will end up never finding one because the, the doorway is, is where you go from one place to another. So if you finally come on a threshold, which is not a doorway, and you want to say a line in the very center of the threshold and up the moldings on the side and on the roof beam on top of a doorway, the line through that 
is, is the doorway, because on this side of the line you're in the other room, and on that side of the line you're in this room. But then you realize that the perfect line has no width. So therefore, you're never in the line. You get it? <laughs> you're, even your toe, as it goes across the threshold, is never in the line because the line isn't there. It moves across a little rectangle. But the, the center of the rectangle is not there. And therefore, ultimately, the rectangle is not there, the door is not there, and neither room is there. Never mind that. <laughs> we won't go that far. But the main point is that the between is subtle. Okay. So, so the, the, and then when we imagine dead people, we just imagine someone who isn't anywhere. But nobody is ever not anywhere. Everybody is somewhere. And everybody, even though the body might be left, the body of the, the super subtle body of the mind, because the mind, when it travels out of the body, travels in an energy, a little super subtle energy in form, in a quantum entity, piece of quantum foam, call it, if you like. The mental foam of a lied person is in a piece of quantum foam. Because the mind always has the body, or mind doesn't mean anything. Body and mind only mean something as being the opposite of each other. So mind can never be without a body. Body can never be without a mind in a sensible universe. Unlike the materialist universe, which is a psychotic universe, or a, a super spiritual universe with only minds that have no bodies, disembodied angel, disembodied God, disembodied, but that's ridiculous. There's no such thing that's relevant to a bodied being. If it has no body, it's irrelevant. If it has no mind, it's irrelevant. Everything is a body-mind. <laughs> There's a lot to be said. So therefore, there are no dead people, since people and other beings don't stay dead, but just migrate from lifetime to lifetime. There's no split second. Like a split second, it split, split, split infinitely, and then it isn't there. So there's only past and future. There's no present. You split, 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 and you bear to get really exact. If you take a little duration, then the tiniest second of a duration, look at those people in those swimming in the Olympics. It's terrible. They train for ages, and the fourth person who doesn't get a medal is like two hundredths of a second behind the guy who gets the bronze medal. And goes, I got a bronze medal. They really should have more medals. Anybody who reaches the final should get a medal. What is this? I can't believe they don't have medals, at least everybody in the final. A semi-final, okay. Uh, <laughs> but everybody, I can't take it. You know, to, you, they, and the computer catches this now, and you see it in the TV screen. Da, 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 da. And they're just hundreds of seconds, and they don't even go to thousands of seconds. But they, but they may have to eventually. It's so amazing. The point is, they're all so beautiful, all those people. They should all get medals. OK. There was a lot to be said about this. But here you should focus on the contemplative experience of those yogis and yoginis who, in practicing the perfection stages of the unexcelled yoga tantras, contemplatively explore the experience of lucid dying, lucid navigating the between states, and lucidly taking rebirth. Through somatic mastery of the subtle levels of mind experience, they report learning how to remain lucid during these experiences, as in lucid dreaming, contemplatively rehearsing lucid dying and being lucidly reborn back into their own coarse bodies, without actually dying and having to find rebirth as new human fetus in a womb, in another person's womb. Most important are the very kind mom, most important are the set of eight inner states they report having traversed in the dying process, astonishingly similar to the eight concentrations we have just discussed. And to list them in a table that I show here on page 167, and you know, really in this, in this thing we should have a projection if somebody can edit it and put in a table for you. You have the dissolution states in the bardo that you reach in the Tibetan book of the natural liberation by learning in between, 
We have earth to water, water to fire, fire to wind, wind to consciousness or space, consciousness to luminance, luminance to radiance, radiance to imminence, and finally imminence to clear transparency. And then this corresponds to the signs and the death thing. And those are the first four correspond to immeasurable love, that's earth to water, the hardness of, war, of, of earth, which can't connect one earth to another because they're solid. So they can't, they bang, they can't connect. But then when they melt into water, they can interflow. So that's love. Water to fire is where love heats up, and that's compassion. <laughs> fire to wind is where compassion becomes joy and just explodes. And then joy becomes incomplete and mutual empathy. And that's pure consciousness, and just pure space, where there's no sense of difference. And then consciousness to luminance is where it's moonlit type space. And then luminance to radiance where it's sunlit type space. And radiance to imminence where it's dark lit type space. So it's pure darkness because the sun is too bright, the moon is too bright, and so on. And, and then imminence to clear transparency is where you can't see it. So there's no subject-object experience at all because you're just as transparent as what you see. So there's no seeing, okay? Because that's like the line. It's, you only have a concept of it. It's no, there's nothing. It's not there, actually. We <laughs> are virtually not there, and yet it's everything in another way. So mirage hallucination is where you start melting. Everything melts. You don't see anything else as solid. Then, then water to fire, you have a kind of feeling of misty or smoky. And then it can be misty at first and then smoke. And then fire to wind, you see like sparks or more coolly, swarm of fireflies, cool sparks, green flashing, <laughs> kind of like that, or moiré pattern of sparks. And then wind to consciousness, the still candle flame is a sign of that internally in your mind. And then consciousness is luminous, where that candle flame turns into pure whiteness. And then that luminous to radiance, and radiance is not luminous, it's just white, it's just sort of pale moonlight, you know. It's, it's like you kind of melt into that light, but it's so pale, you know. It's a little bit chilly, it's pale, you know. And then, but then you, when that's infinite space, it's like, whew, it's like you are being just spacious, but then it becomes infinite. So that's kind of a white moonlit thing, and you, that's, that's called luminance. It's not called appearance. Everything is appearing. It's, it's a vision of luminance, of like, like you have in moonlight space, where everything seems to be self-lit. And then, but in a dull way, then the mind that's used to being a point of separation from the objects around it feels a little still scared as it expands toward infinity. Because the given infinity, there might be something lurking out there that will destroy it or something. So then it becomes bright because it explodes. And then it's like a sun. And then so it's like a brilliant, like a thousand suns, what they talk like that. <laughs> Which is it's a big rush at first, like, you know. It's like you're burning anything that might be bad out of your way, you know. And you're the infinite sun, you know. You're supernova in that, you know. But since it's just you and there's nothing burning, so you don't feel hot. But in a way, you are like hot. And then at some point, you kind of get bored with that. And then, you, then you're not afraid to not exist. So then you kind of finally let go of this of a, almost a further subtle point of you. You-ness, even just as a point somewhere in there. Because you, know, you still have a concept of that you are not you are you. And you haven't let go of being you. You're still connecting to your own continuum, kind of, at some super subtle level. But then you are, okay, it's, you want to have, it's like you want to get in the shade from the sun. You want, you want to go to sleep. You want to be unconscious, so you go into pure darkness. And that's like the, in the formless realm of nothingness, right? Akim Jani Ayatana, the medium of pure, no, of pure nothing, of nothing whatsoever. And you let it happen. Okay, fine. Can't remember having been born. And then, from that point on, you then rem you still your subtle point still reasserts itself. Of I'm Bob all alone. So there's no difference between dark and light. 
sunlight, moonlight, dark light, candlelight, no difference. So I'm consciously unconscious. Psychosis, <laughs> infinite psychosis, infinite formlessness. And nobody, I think, really, and then I could be really stuck there. The only thing that saves me from being really stuck is this stubborn subjectivity that has itself infinite energy because it is ultimately clear light and it's loving and it loves and it wants everyone to feel the bliss of this incredible world and the beauty of it and the joy of it and somehow it saves from the psych it, it, it comes out of the psychosis to be everywhere in all of the states simultaneously. That's, and that's, that's kind of Buddhahood. That is really great. That's the one point of it. So, so, and those are, t so in, the, in a way, to the, even the more coarse level p person, Buddha teaches the cosmos as the eight subtle states of mind. And the eight subtle states of mind have to do with the way, the best way of seeing the cosmos, actually. So here, dark matter is encountered at this eight, seventh state. And then clear light is never encountered, actually. But somehow clear light is the confidence that it is everywhere, so you can't not encounter it. So you can be loving in any situation. Which means somehow clear light, the transparent energy, moves through you. And you can you become the extreme artist, which is a Buddha. And you can create pure lands and Buddha lands. And you can create the most fantastic environments for other beings at whatever level. And they never will, they, they simply will not be able to channel their clear light into a hellish state. Or, or, or they can think they can, but they never will be allowed to. Power of freedom is too great. These eight dissolution stages, okay. Anyway, I'd like to show you this thing, the, the, this scheme. It's, it's never, not written anywhere. It was, and I'll tell you why. I once had a debate with a geishi in New Delhi, and he was furious that I was saying this. And I had, because I had discovered it, I was just saying what I discovered. He was furious. And, because, and then finally he said, well, the thing is that the, the yogi who encounters these eight states by developing their samadhi is doing it with their coarse mind. And the coarse mind is defined as the one in the body of the five senses, and, uh, and, uh, and then the sixth sense, the mental sense. And then the mental sense can go in and up and down in this thing. And that's the coarse mind yogi. And that yogi uh, of a coarse mind would not, cannot find that when they fall asleep. They cannot find that at the, at the brink of death. Uh, and they, they might, actually, if they really would develop this kind of samadhi, they might, actually. But it's, but it's hard, and therefore they shouldn't know about it ahead of time. So the, this, this one on the right in the Book of the Dead is for the coarse mind. Then why did Padmasambhava, supposedly, in Buddhist history, in Tibetan history, bring this out of the Abhidharma, this death process thing, and make it a popular book for the ordinary masses in Tibet, which had never been done in India. Why? And this is the greatness of the Tibetan gift to India and to the... But what is a gift they got from India, but in India, the way the time was, they weren't able to share it with the mass people. And why is that? That's for political reasons. The esoteric things... Mystics in the West, what do they do? They burn them at the stake. They burn the witches, who were millions of them. They were way ahead of the men. They knew about herbs. They knew how you could cure the common cold. They knew how to be loving. They left, they went and left it in a little hut outside the town and happily with the herbs out there. Then, they, then some idiot who has a bad relationship with somebody because he mistreats his family. Oh, they cursed me, that's why I, can't, that's why I have ED. Ah, it's a witch! And they went and burned them. It didn't help, actually, unfortunately. So that's the way it is. And, and India and China and these places were not ready. They still had oppressive kings, 
much less in India because of the greater wealth. And the power of the women became greater in India. But uh, the power of the militarism became less and less. That's why they got conquered. But then still the Siddhas kept this alive. But they wanted it to be alive in a fuller form than they were able to when some idiots were coming in and burning the libraries and just closing the schools and again oppressing the women like they weren't so oppressed in India. And so therefore they are ah, those Tibetans. Nobody can conquer them. They've been conquering other people. But if they live more happily in their own environment, they won't need to because they'll have ample. The yaks will feed them with their milk and butter <laughs> and dried meat. And those yaks are tremendous. They, and the huge step they have. And they were brilliant genius ecologists, those Siddhas. And so they themselves took rebirth up there in Tibet. They sent the text up there. They lured the Tibetans down to study there in the great Indian monastic thing. And then they sent them back. And then they knew they'd be safe from everybody. Only finally the British went there. And then the Chinese went after the British by adopting the industrial, stupid, materialist lifestyle and the stupid communism from the Western colonial people. But never mind, they would absorb that. And they went and stopped, the, they even stopped their own Mongolians from going and beating up everybody. They stopped them and made them vulnerable and demilitarized them. And they foresaw this time now where the esoteric is more safe. The women finally will be more powerful. They will be equal. They don't want to be too powerful because then they'll get too complacent and silly. They want to be equal. And that's what we're coming to. And Rihanna Eisler should get a Nobel Peace Prize, actually. I can see if they still have a committee for her, who wrote The Chalice and the Blade and who has the Partnership Nonprofit Society in Los Angeles. That should be globally more known, because that is how we make Shambhala, you know. The women. And I think maybe Kamala Devi, this is going to be, I'm sorry, I know that's time bound, but you, you heard it here. That's going to happen. The point is that this esoteric thing needn't be hidden now so much. I think that's why the Dalai Lama is opening the gates of it. Why, why Vishwamata murmured to him in the ear in his dream that he could teach everywhere Kala Chakra. Usually a Dalai Lama only even teaches in Tibet and a pension Lama once or twice in a lifetime, except in their closest monastery. So it's not even widely available that much in Tibet. But he taught 34, 30, and he'll teach it again, I'm sure, once he gets his legs back. These eight dissolution stages. I'm sorry, I went into prophecy here because <laughs> I'm in a good mood. Uh, never mind. Okay, we'll, stick, we'll come back to the book. It's, it's in the book. I, by doing this, in a way, I'm bringing the exo esoteric into the exoteric. And I'm following His Holiness's Justification. He could change his mind. If the fascists win, we have to have World War III, because they will definitely do World War III if they destroy democracy in any one country, in all the countries. They'll definitely, because they'll have nothing left to do but oppress their own people. Once they're only oppressing, it suck out more juice out of them. And if they do that, their people will be pissed off with them. And when the people do that, they have to confuse them by pretending an enemy did it. So then they'll smirk to each other. In the, in, the, in, the, in the red line, and then they'll have more wars to kill off people and to deflect the... That's what they used to do for centuries with the kings and queens. They would just kill each other. They'd send the peasants to kill each other so they wouldn't come and burn down the palaces. That's what they've been doing. And created this... And the, the colonial thing was the last version of that. But somehow, life itself is so kind... Mother Earth is so generous. The Buddhas are so present that even the most vicious, violent people figure out that they can't find their, realize their own aims without becoming nice. It, because they bang into themselves. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it's going to be. I can detect. I don't know. I can detect something. Some people's mind. It's going to happen. It has been regularized over. So, yeah. 
So, so that's why the astronauts of the Buddhas, Buddha, of this Eightfold Path, are the psychonauts, the ones who travel like astronauts into the inner space, which is like going to not just, not just seeing dark matter and dark energy, by the way of seeing with a telescope the rotation of galaxies. It's like going to those galaxies inwardly, in your own, in your own body, in your subtle body, made of the subtle energy of the mind, through mediated by going to the subtle, your own neuroscience, and then inside the neuroscience, finding the core subjectivity in the, in the brain, in the heart, in the chakras, you know, really brilliant. So these eight dissolution stages are developed out of an experiential gradient that no doubt could be divided into a larger or smaller number of levels. It has been regularized over centuries by the psychonaut explorer who have ventured into the inner realm of this most important time in the life and death process as most useful for those seeking to refine their consciousness to include such subtle planes of their own existence in conscious awareness. During the first four stages, the subtle consciousness detaches from its entanglement in the coarse elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, which stand for the abstract qualities of solidity, cohesion, temperature, and motion, together making a coarse body possible. It goes along with the central nervous system that is schematized as a tree-like structure of a brow crone to perineum genital tip central channel entwined by two channels on right and left, which form a trunk with five or seven, etc., wheel nexuses at brain, throat, heart, navel, and genital levels, from which nexuses branch out the symbolic number of 72,000 nerve channels that animate the sensitivities of the coarse body. The withdrawal and dying of the subtle consciousness from the coarse body is described as the gradual movement of drops of neurochemical awareness from the peripheral nervous system into the central, I should say, neurochemical mediated awareness, that, that awareness from this peripheral nervous system into the central channel, the drops themselves associated with the essences of semen and ovum blood, similar to neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and cortisol. The withdrawal of awareness is schematized into the experience of the first four inner signs, ending in the single still candle flame experience. <laughs> yeah, the vision states of luminance, radiance, and imminence correspond to semen, blood, and, and pure energy, or, or subtle energy without either fluid substance. The withdrawal of awareness is schematized into the experience of the first four inner signs, and the earth, water, fire, wind are schematized into Buddha Lochana, Buddha uh, Mamaki, Buddha Pandara Vasini, and Buddha Tara, Samayatara, the five, four goddesses who, take it, who, who control those, those tendencies to solidity, fluency, temperature, and movement. The deeper withdrawal then ensues as the white drops from the crown and the red drops from the navel, respectively, below the navel actually, from the hara, descend and ascend through the central channel until they reach the center of the heart wheel. This is described as the withdrawal of the super subtle awareness from the subtle body mind to the super subtle body mind, a mentally genetic continuum enclosed in the center of the heart wheel from conception to death. The luminous stage is when the white drops descend from the brain wheel to the heart wheel. The radiant stage is when the red drop ascends from the subnavel to the heart. And the imminent stage is when the two kinds of drops return to the enclosure of the dark bluish super subtle body mind whose wave particle paradox embracing physical mental dichotomy embracing continuum's presence has been there since conception in the case of a human mammal in the womb. This deeper withdrawal consummates when the imminent threshold state gives way to the clear light transparency state of the super subtle body mind 
where lucid wakeful awareness experiences the transparency twilight state of the clear light of the free void. This is defined in Buddhist science as the moment of death, since this super subtle dark blue mental gene drop is no longer bound by white and red subtle drops in the heart center. And if the person is not self-aware of their being at this super subtle level, leaves the body and moves out into the cosmos, driven by unconscious drives like a feather in the wind. The normal, non-subtle self-aware person's awareness more or less experiences this as a total falling asleep, final fainting, passing out, or losing consciousness, and never becomes conscious of their own deepest, boundless, infinitesimal, and infinite, lucidly awake reality of the clear light, transparency, super subtle level, and is instructed in the great book of natural liberation to try to identify with the infinite space-like experience as their deepest self. The reason that this scientific description of the dying process is so important to anyone anticipating or undergoing the dying transition is that it is important to remain calm and fearless when going through it. This is the time when the final samadhi branch of the Noble Eightfold Path really comes into its own, since its yogic development in life has given the wisdom intelligence the microscope-like focus in time and space to perceive the subtle transformation. Traditionally, what you are told to do is disidentify from the instinctual urges impinging on your illusory fixed self so as not to be thrashed around by them. This enables you as the dying person to have a far more subtle awareness of the specifics of the process, so as to enter lucidly into the inevitable release of the great bliss of death, the letting go of all stress of boundaries and conflicts of self and other. If you can go through this kind of subtle transition calmly, you have the best chance of migrating consciously into better and better future life situations. Knowing the layout of the experiences, this is thus extremely helpful. Even more helpful, of course, is rehearsing the process in contemplative exercises ahead of time, through, though obviously you have to be extremely well instructed, highly developed, and even then, very cautious and careful. Now I will end here in the reading, but I have to say one thing. In this thing, when I just, because I just realized something reading it, I haven't quite realized before, and it connects to a misunderstanding I have about clear light when I dare to say that no one ever perceives clear light. This is wrong of me to say. No one, because no one ever not perceives it, actually, is more real. And either one can be said. So I'm, I'm being dogmatic in saying that, to resist people going around claiming to be enlightened. So I, that's wrong of me. Why? Because the fourth formless state Although Buddha says none of these are nirvana, and he is not lying in saying that. But nevertheless, being simultaneously conscious and unconscious, or being neither conscious and unconscious, it's only put in the latter way. When you're neither conscious or unconscious, in a way you're simultaneously conscious and unconscious. So that state, actually, is enlightenment. Definitely, too. And in fact, it's the securest way of being enlightened. It is, just, it is because it is the super psychotic way of being, completely disconnected from everything. And disconnected, therefore, between the duality between matter and mind, and mind and matter. And by itself, of course, what I said can still be said as true, 
it is not that that fourth state is not Buddhahood, because before Buddha went through the artistic drama of leaving his body that he didn't have to leave, because a Buddha is always in the state, in the fourth state, fourth formless realm, because a Buddha is everywhere. Clear light is everywhere. Everything is clear light. And Buddha is clear light. But he also is a magic body. So he also performs magical art performances, miraculous magical art performances, to benefit others. And for people who are craving some permanent psychotic state for fear of pain, then they, they have to be told that that fourth samadhi state is not, is not all there is to it. But when a, when a yogi attains nirvikalpa samadhi, they will be forced to know that. So they are forced to then realize they are present everywhere. And then what has happened to them if they've jumped precipitously into that state, like a, like a dualistic Buddhist can do, and become an arhat, their apprenticeship in the arts is longer and slower <laughs> because their removal from passion is so total. And it's very hard to get down to the nitty gritty for them because they're so attached to their psychotic infinity that it really takes some time. It really does. So, so in other words, the fourth state so therefore, what I'm trying to say it is non-exclusivistically to Brahminical yogis and yoginis. When you reach the fourth formless realm, the ultimate trance, the Brahma Nirvana of Tattvam Azi, that can be thought of, you're at Buddhahood. You're in Buddhahood, actually. But it's only that, they, and you do have something which is, is esoteric in your system, which you call Prasta Chaturthi, beyond the fourth state. And what that means is when you realize that in the state of beyond infinite space and consciousness and nothingness, there is being conscious and unconscious at the same time, or neither conscious and unconscious, as any individuated person. You merge with everybody else. And in a way, you could say it's instantaneously, or you realize you have always been merged with everybody else. So you then go beyond even being Brahma. You and Brahma go beyond being even God. And you become Buddha automatically. OK? So that, that's then His Holiness, His truth speaking, that he's not saying he wants everybody in India to be Buddhist. He wants everybody in India to be Buddha through their own system, without converting to any ism, such as Buddhism. And up until they reach a beyondism state, beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, they can be Hinduism, if they want to call it that, or Jainism, if they want to call it that, or secularism, if they want to call it that. And secularism, they will get to dark matter and dark energy. And they'll finally realize that bright matter and bright energy can only manage to coexist with dark matter and dark energy through transparent matter and energy being released there from everywhere. They can only realize that through secular humanism, through humanistic scientism. Even that will get there. He's not, he's not sneakily trying to convert them. They will, reality will convert them to something, realism, true realism, beyond any ism, beyond any ism, it will reveal that. So this is really important. I, and I detect, in, even in this chapter of mine, that I'm still thinking somehow clear light is beyond there. But wrong, because clear light is in all of those trances, of course, but you're closest to it in that trance fourth formless realm. That is why in the Parinibbana Sutta, Buddha went there to show he mastered that. 
And it was his ability of having gone there that enabled him to then come back all the way to the desire realm, to the edge of it, and then not scare people by going really all the way into it, and then scare the monks, you know, but then come back to the top of the, to the Brahma state of the highest form realm and the event horizon between that and the, for, and the immaterial realm, between matter and non-matter, matter and antimatter or something. And there's no bad antimatter going to destroy matter, don't worry. And then create Buddha, Buddha lands, Buddha verses. That's so beautiful. So we leave it there today. We dedicate the merit to uh, everybody achieving clear light, magic body, indivisible, communion with all reality, communion with all life force as soon as possible, and so that they can be more effectively helping everybody else achieve that just equal to them. Okay, Gewa Dia Nyoduda, Chesun Jamyang Sunju Chubjone, Toa Chitam Malupa Dejala Gobashow.